What is going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Real Fans FC. Just me and Will today. Adam couldn't make it because he got caught up with some plans that he already had months and months in advance so we had to give him the pto you know (laughs) (laughs) but just me and him rocking it today we got concacaf nations league we want to talk about concacaf champions league round of 16 the first leg and then obviously the world's greatest competition the uefa champions league we're going to talk a little bit of that as well so let's get into it will how are you feeling today Man, I'm feeling excited. Uh, like you said, Julian, CONCACAF Nations League, we are, uh, we're about a couple weeks away. So I'm really getting excited for that with Panama. Uh, also excited for the CONCACAF Nations League play-in games. I know you being a, oh, the fellow Costa Rican. I'm not excited. So. I'm feeling anxious. <laughs> <laughs> Super anxious. Oh, man. Uh, but, but let's yeah, get into no. it. So, yeah. Uh, let's we'll start with the first game uh, that I have here: USA versus Jamaica. So I'll start with you, Will. How how do you feel about this game? I guess give me your like thoughts, and I guess I know some predictions. Yeah. Uh, so first thing, kind of with it, I don't know if you saw earlier this week they had the uh, like the Nations League coaches preview yes. a little bit. The coaches, yeah. So they're coming, talking. Uh, and talking specific with Jamaica and the U.S., Burhalter was there. Everybody's, you know, destined coach. Everybody loves that guy. So, but <laughs> him and him and Holgerson. So, but it was interesting hearing the two of them talk. Um, going down to team breakdown, uh, I think one name that we have to say, and this guy, he arguably could probably be the best player on the, the field for that game. It's Lee on Bailey. I think what Leon Bailey has been able to do over the span of the past, not just couple weeks, but past months for Ashton Villa. I mean, these guys are contenders, not just guys that are looking to qualify for Champions League, but contenders of winning the Premier League title. So I think it's a big statement coming in from a lot of the Jamaican players, not just him, Michael Antonio. Uh, Damari Gray is doing quite well right now in the Saudi Arabian League. Um, A lot of these guys are coming in form. But the question is going to be, again, that we've said over and over about the Jamaican national team, what Jamaica are we going to get? You know, and and I'll say it myself, I'm quite critical on their national team with the type of development, the type of depth that they have, because quite arguably people could say, like uh, looking wise, chart wise, they have the second best team on paper in CONCACAF. And, and that's the Jamaican national team but they don't perform up to that. You know, they usually lose in the quarterfinals of the gold cup, get knocked out by Mexico and nations league, whether it's Panama, Mexico, Costa Rica, you know, they haven't made a world cup in a while. So like I said, this is going to be what Jamaica are we going to receive? Uh, Does Holgerson have these guys in check? I think the U S the biggest um, downline going in for them is still no Tyler Adams in the midfield. He's a very key pivotal role. And I know we'll kind of get into it a little bit. Can Johnny Cordoza be the guy to take over that? It's going to be, it, I think this is going to be such a unique battle within not just the midfield, but every part of the field. I mean, Leon Bailing going at, you know, Cameron Carter Vickers and Chris Richards. You know, you're going to have Christian Pulisic, Tim Uwea, uh other guys for the U.S. going at Ethan Pinnock, you know, one of the best center backs right now for Brentford or the starter, the number one that they have. So it's just so many interesting different sides. You can look at this game. If we had to get to a prediction, though, I would genuinely say that I think the U.S. has the edge on hand. Of course, it's being played in the U.S. Uh, The U.S. is obviously more of a favorite, have a little bit better of a roster. I mean, looking at past history, Jamaica can compete, though. They have beaten the U.S., uh, if I'm not incorrect, in the Gold Cup 2017, if I'm not – yep. Or no, correct that. 2015, they beat them. And then in 2017, they played them in the final. And they did lose that game by one. But still, I think Jamaica has what it takes. Obviously, we've seen. But as of right now, if it's the Jamaica that we saw last summer in the Gold Cup, um, then then the U.S. is going to win this game, I would say, hands down. Yeah. the uh, I'm with the U.S. too. Because the thing goes with Jamaica, like – all these players play so well individually for their clubs. They're in form. They're doing well. But like you said, we've just we've yet to see Jamaica put it together on paper for high quality opponents. Obviously, we see them absolutely. You know, they had a really good performance against Canada. 
And Mm -hmm. I'll give them credit on that. That's probably one of their best victories in a long time with this new generation of players because Canada, maybe we say Canada's peaked already. Maybe they're already on the downturn, which it's kind of looking like that. But like you said, Jamaica is the second best team on paper. And to me, it's not even a question. Like, we would in the, for the United States, they would kill to have some of those players. You know what I mean? All, anybody in CONCACAF would kill to have some of those players. And I like, I don't, I think with time, it's a team that's going to get better and kind of understand each other because I think too, there's a huge drop off. And I think it's when you don't have that subtle increase in quality. I think it can be really hard to kind of mesh with players. Like, for example, we see it in the MLS a lot when you have a DP that's a European legend. It comes over here, but then he he struggles or he gets frustrated because the quality is just not up to that par. And I think yeah. Jamaica is kind of seeing that. They're kind of like feeling like almost built like an MLS team in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I think having – the problem is they just have no depth. And then some of the places where they don't have that talent and that quality, it's a huge drop off. So, and they're heavily relying on a lot of dual nationals. Obviously Jamaica doesn't have a super strong development system, at least as of right now. So they're kind of relying on a lot of that English uh, Jamaican immigrants to England. Yeah. If they could keep on doing that, because there is a large population of those of of them of Jamaican immigrants in England, if they could keep on doing that, sure. I don't know how sustainable that is if we're talking about mm-hmm. long term. But as of right now in this game, I think they're progressively getting better. I wouldn't be surprised to see a really close game, and I honestly mm-hmm. wouldn't even be surprised to see Jamaica lose because I do think they're progressively getting better. They're starting to understand each other a little bit more. I. But I, I still have to give the edge to the United States because there is just going to be more quality, even off the bench. I know a lot of USMNT fans feel that uh, there's a huge drop off after the starting 11. Yeah, but that drop off is still better than what Jamaica's is at the end of the day. And yeah. there's a little bit more cohesion in the United States because they've now played with each other for a while. As much as I dislike Burr Halter, I think he's a, a really below average coach in, at the international level. And. Yeah. But they still understand. They still have a system, and they're playing at home, like you said, which is a really big advantage. Because if there's one thing that the U.S. always does is they play at home. They never play away, barely ever, unless they're right. forced to in uh, qualifying or in this or in the Nations League tournament, um, mm-hmm. except for the final for some reason. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, um, yeah, I think they just have it. And then I know you mentioned like Tyler Adams and Johnny Cardoso. We could kind of briefly talk about that a little bit. Is yeah. I like Cardoso. though. Um, I, to me, he, he's the clear cut starter next to McKinney as of right now. I know Tyler Adams is just now getting healthy. If not, he's already healthy, but he's going to have to take time to get adjusted. And I think him being at Bournemouth mm-hmm. training with the team, getting ready is probably the best thing for him because mm-hmm. who knows how well he's going to come back. And then you want to put him in a very important game. Versus you have yeah. a guy like Johnny Cordoso, who's already played big matches against some of the best teams in the world in Barcelona and Real Madrid. And he now has the quality and the capability. And honestly, I know a lot of USMNT stands are going to be are really big on Tyler Adams because he's the captain. He's all this mm-hmm. stuff. But like, there's going to hit a point where I think Johnny Cordoso has to be the clear cut starter. And you have to put Tyler Adams on the bench unless you run a low yeah. mid block type of system. Because this guy, is, he's letting it known that he's hes letting everybody know that, hey, there's an opening here and it's mine. Because Yunus Musa is starting to fall off at Milan. He's not getting as much mm-hmm. playing time. Uh, McKinney's playing out of his mind. So that spot is locked in for him. And I, I think for the foreseeable future and maybe going into Copa America... I think you have to roll in with Johnny Cardoso. I think he's just, he's shown more quality. He shows yeah. more ability. He's healthy and he's in, he's in great form. And Tyler Adams has missed so much time. I don't know. And then if, it, when he comes back, like, I don't know how well he's going to play, how much they're going to regulate his minutes in Bournemouth. I don't know if he comes back healthy, if he's a straight up starter. I don't follow yeah. Bournemouth. So I don't really 
know where he falls in that depth chart versus I just feel like you have to go with a guy on a team that's a mid to top level team in La Liga who's playing really mm-hmm. well right now. To me, he's he's the clear cut. And then, uh, yeah, and then we can go into like the striker debate. To me, obviously, Balogun's the guy. He, you have to go with him. It's just Ooh, it is over Pepe. He's having a, he doesn't play. He doesn't play. I'm not going to put in a twenty year old guy. No, he, yeah. no. Yeah, he doesn't. I yeah. wouldn't, I'm not going to put true. in a twenty year old guy who runs the bench in the area divisie. As bad as a yeah. year as Flo Balogun has had this season mm-hmm. in um, in the French league, he still has talent. He still has talent at the end of the day. He's playing at a higher level, and he's getting more consistent minutes. And he's he has these moments of flashes this year, but he's shown quality mm-hmm. to play at a super high level. And I just don't think we've seen that from Pepe. The most we've seen from Pepe is what he did in MLS and right. what he did on a low-level team in the Eredivisie. When he was mm-hmm. in Germany, maybe that wasn't the best fit for him, but he didn't show that he was able to play at that level yet. And, a, and a clearly to PSV, they don't feel that he's ready to play at that level yet. So yeah. there's a lot of question marks. I'm really interested to see how Burhalter forms this team. Like, does he start Gio Reyna? I know, yeah. like, I, I'm probably going to get a lot of shit from this if people are USMT fans. But, like, dude, these guys overhype Gio Reyna so hard. It comes to 1, a thousand point. 1,000%. 1,000%. It comes to a point yeah. where the guy's just not that good. Like, how long are you going to defend a guy who's either injured, not getting playing time, he gets alone. He has a bad agent. He like he's on a team that's fighting relegation battle. Like, like, what do you want? Like, do you want him to be in the most perfect, clean position ever? I just don't think the guy. I think he's a talented guy. He definitely has a place on this roster. He could. He. I think he's for sure a starter caliber player as of right now on this team. I think mm-hmm. he is in real competition with Malik Tillman. Um, because at least Malik Tillman is getting consistent minutes. He's playing well in the area de Vizier. He's in the number one team in the area de Vizier. He's playing mm. in the Champions League. Like, you have to get start giving serious looks. I know that he hasn't played well for the U.S. team, but, like, you have to – it gets to a point where you have to get him, like, serious looks. And, yeah. look, am I going to say Gio Reyna got a fair shake? No. I think he gets played out of position a lot. Maybe he doesn't get starting minutes because coaches don't like him. He has getting getting injured, but like it comes to a certain point where it's like, dude, how long how long are you gonna offend a guy who just it's it's not clicking? It's just not. You know, this might also like, be an unpopular talking about Gio Reyna, like you were saying, Julian. And, and some US men's national team fans, diehards, you know, I've already gotten some beef with them on Instagram <laughs> being being a Panama supporter, but I'll keep it going. I think the move to Nottingham Forest was a move that obviously was backwards for him, but it was also a bad move for him. Nottingham, I mean, he's already there with his uh, American. I agree. I agree. With Matt Turner. And Matt, I mean, that's another whole story, the goalkeeping situation for the U.S. Because Matt Turner's not playing. You know, Matt Turner, I don't think, has gotten or even gotten any minutes for Nottingham since, I want to say January, maybe even before that. You know, so it kind of comes into the It's not his level. Yeah, I think the Prem... And I think people too with like Gio Reyna, it's like the Prem is not his level. Champions League is not his level. I think as mm-hmm. of right now, you you either have to really consider him to be in the area de Vizier or maybe French League. I could see him play well in maybe La Liga and Serie A in a lower level team where he can start mm-hmm. consistently. Because to be fair, I do want to see him play in a team that isn't fighting relegation. So they have to play super low block and just try to grind out victories to stay alive. Mm-hmm. He needs to play for a team. I don't know, maybe like a Villarreal in, in Spain or like an Atalanta in Syria, yeah. something kind of mid table team could potentially be fighting for Europa league. I think that's just his level. And, but I, we I would go as far we still, we, we would still have to see though at the end of the day, mm-hmm. because obviously the German league is too yeah. physical for him. The exactly. English Premier League is right. way too physical for him, for yeah. sure. So the, I don't think English football is for him. I just don't think it is. I think he's too fragile. Yeah. He has to play in a more technical league. And But yeah. I'm still on the fence. Until I get pro- until he truly shows me otherwise and he can actually get a proper move, it comes to a certain point where it's like, 
look, we can't overhype this guy. He is a little overrated at this point. I get he has potential, but how long are you going to ride onto the potential? It's been years now. Mm-hmm. It's been years. We're in 2024. Right. Like, I mean, and they've been talking yeah. about this guy for like five years. Like, when are mm-hmm. we actually going to see like something proper outside of flashes? Like, when are you going right. to see him become a man of a match in an important game? Like, yeah, I mean, yes, does he need the man. minutes? Yes, he does need the minutes. Yeah. And does his maybe his manager give him a fuck them over a lot of times? Sure, but right. I think at a certain level, if you are that certain quality, it doesn't matter what position you are. You shouldn't have not every player is going to be put in the absolute perfect position imaginable, get exactly what they want. That's just not the world we live in. And every time I see a player where they, no matter what sport it is, where they where they they don't perform well if they're not in the absolute perfect situation in the perfect system, I always question that. It's like, yeah. why do you need to be in such a perfect place just to do well? There's a certain point right. if you're this quality that everybody says you are, it shouldn't matter. Sure, could you be optimized to perform better? Yeah, but like you shouldn't be riding the bench if you're have this much quality there's clearly something that right. the coaches are seeing because those coaches they know more than me they forgot more right. football than i've learned like let's be real so they're clearly <laughs> seeing something yeah yeah i think like you said I, two quick real quick things before we move on because i know we want to talk a little bit about panama mexico i think like you said on Gio Reyna, i think that's the one word that just stands out for him you know and like you said i don't want to criticize the guy in the sense of saying oh you know, he's a garbage football player or no, he's not good. I mean, Gio Reyna is a standout. He's an American talent. And he's definitely, I would say, probably one of the top five players on the U.S. men's national team at this moment. But yeah. He's fragile. He's so fragile. And that's the thing. I mean, whether it's him getting injured during World Cup qualifiers, whether it's him getting injured in the Nations League final last summer against Canada, you know, the guy is very, very he just gets injured. He gets beaten up. And like you said, that if the German league is too hard for him, how is he going to translate over in the English Premier League? I mean, it, like that's what I was saying. The move was just not the right move, move fit for him. To be quite honest with you, I don't want to say Gio Reyna is at, you know, League Two or La Liga Two, you know, level. But I genuinely no. think like a championship in England, the second division might be something more. I think it's, you know, that's even more physical. I think that's even more. Yeah, that is. He has to play. He has to play in a more technical league. That's and that's why I said like Syria, La Liga, or the French league. I think he needs to play in a league that where maybe it's a team that's not absolutely threatened with regulate relegation, but like he can at least get consistent yeah. minutes just to see. I just feel like I need to s- properly see him throughout a full season because right. all I ever see is him in a U.S. jersey or like coming off the bench. Like I want to see him throughout a full season to actually prove to me that he's like as good as everybody says he is and is advertised. But yeah, yeah, I guess we kind of went on a little bit of a U.S. Rant yeah. Right. right. No, um, and like yeah, you I guess said, overall. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, like you say, said, I think, Oh God, you got, no, no, I was just going to go to predictions, but go ahead. Get your last thought. Yeah. Say that's exactly what I was going to say. Predictions. I think, I think the U S will win this game. I think Jesse Mar. We lost you, Will. All right, you're back now. You're good. Okay. Oh, we lost you again. You got muted. As soon as you start talking. Now? Okay, you're good now. All good now? Yeah, you're good now. Hurry up. Give us okay. your thoughts. <laughs> give us your prediction. <laughs> yeah, I think the U.S. is going to win this. I think they, they have to make a signature tournament. If the U.S. really wants to be a contender or even think about contending for the Copa America and to be in that conversation, they're going to have to win the Nations League. I think this is a big game, obviously, and uh, this is going to be a tough test. Jamaica is a tough, tough. They're a gritty team. Regardless of what Jamaica comes, these guys are some dogs. They're dogs in the trenches. They're going to compete. I think the U.S. will prevail, though. I could see like a two to one, a three to one. So anywhere around there. I see a two to one. I actually think it's going to be a pretty close game. I think, like I said, even though Jamaica hasn't, if you want to call Canada a big win, you can, because I I don't know necessarily what to rate Canada right now. I don't, I think they're falling off, but 
I don't know. It's a little weird at the moment yeah. when it comes to them, but they are definitely a team. I think is progressively getting better as they get to get to know each other. And as the coach gets to implement his system. So, so I think it's going to be two, one I'm with you on that one with USA winning mm-hmm. because at the end of the day, you're still going to get Burr ball and yeah. he's not going to get the most out of his players regardless, but let's switch over to your team, Panama versus Mexico. I started off with you. Man, oh, this is this is a big one. Uh, like you said, being a Panamanian national team supporter ever since I came out of my mom's womb, you know, that was <laughs> always probably one of the uh, biggest moments I live for for these games, watching, you know, my men's national team play and, and watching the boys take the field. Uh, in regards to this game specifically, going into it, uh, one of the big things for the Panama storyline are our injuries. We are, I will say, probably out of the four teams here on the depth chart. I mean, obviously, I could be biased and say we're the number one, but realistically, looking at you know the the values and looking at the depth, we are probably the fourth team out of the four teams here. So it's obviously we're already kind of a little bit on a lower pedestal, but it doesn't help. Our starting right back, Michael Amir Murillo from Marseille, is out injured. And he is potentially, they're still looking at the Copa America, whether or not he'll be able to come back. He's out. Uh, We've got a couple more guys in the midfield that I know we have some injuries with. Um, The big question also for us, and this has always been an issue uh, going up to the top, who's going to be our starting striker? Um, We do right now at the moment, we have Cecilia Waterman, who plays out of Alianza Lima in Peru. And then we have Jose Fajardo Nelson, who plays out of Universidad Católica, which is located in Ecuador. Both, in my opinion, great, really, really good strikers, but not that killer striker. I think Cecilia Waterman, in my personal opinion, and he's been hot as of late in the Peruvian first league, but also, of course, you have to look at the caliber of teams he's playing. He scored, I want to say if I'm not wrong, four four goals so far, but they're in week five. So he scored almost every single game except for two, one or two different games. But it's going to be able to, I mean, honestly come down to the question is, can we score against Mexico? You know, we played them two times last summer, last year in 2023, and we lost both games one to zero. Defensively, I think we match up quite well with Mexico. And I think that's another big storyline talking about player development and players coming in and out of the system. I think Mexico, obviously, we can say that this is probably one of the worst Mexican national teams that we've seen in in years. And to just look at the type of roster that they have, if I was, I think I was looking at this a little bit earlier today, Panama has more guys. Now, granted, I do want to say in leagues that are a little bit lower, but still more number-wise than Mexico has players playing over in Europe, overseas. So that... That's just showing something about the Mexican national team. A lot of their players are returning back to Mexico. I saw one of the big ones was, uh, what's his name, Jorge Sanchez. He's returning back. He's leaving Porto. Obviously, Jesus Corona went back to Monterrey. You know, a lot of these guys, and this has happened over the years, and there was another young guy, uh, Flores. I want to say that's his last name. He left. He's back at Tigres now. Diego Linus, that was a little bit ago. He's back at Tigres. These guys... They go over there, and obviously, you know, we can talk a little about it. Their development, I feel like they get so used to the Liga MX, and they get so comfortable to the point where they go over to Europe and they're not really starting a lot, or they're not, maybe sometimes they don't get along the best with the coach, or they don't fit the system the best. So they say, okay, we leave. So I think, obviously, on paper, you know, years past, you could say, well, Mexico had this player, this player, and they still do. Obviously, Santi Jimenez is going to be a threat no matter what. Uh, Chucky Lozano, depending on his health, uh, he'll be a threat, of Raul course. Jimenez. Yeah, Raul Jimenez. I, as of late, he hasn't been doing too, too yeah, hot. he's getting but old. He was, he's getting old. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's getting – he'll get hot. He'll get hot. But him at Fulham – and that's the thing. They still have weapons. Of course, Edson Alvarez, he scored over the weekend for West Ham against Everton. I mean, he's arguably, I would say, probably their best player. But that's the thing. Like I said, I still genuinely believe that Panama can match up well with them defensively, you know. And I'm going to, for a minute, I'm going to take off my Panama cap and try to be the least biased I can and say that that Panama, I feel, defensively will match up well. They did it in the Gold Cup, and they also did it last year in the Nations League third-place match against Mexico. The thing is, like I said, 
what I think really kills Panama, and this is the type of ball that we've been playing under Christensen, is obviously it's not exactly similar to it, the Barcelona way, but Tiki Taka. Thomas Christensen has built this system where the guys move intricately from one player to another player, and the ball moves with them. And the positioning of the space is wide, wide open on the field, and players are moving everything. And this is also coming back to our midfield where it's so vital. And I have to say his name, Karaskia. I mean, he has been, in my personal opinion, either him or Edson Alvarez, two best midfielders in CONCACAF. I, it's no hands down, but three, him, uh, Karaskia, uh, Edson Alvarez, and Weston McKenney are probably the best three. But that's where he kind of comes into the play, and he has to work those positions. I think that's what really killed Panama also last year, uh, last summer in the Gold Cup final, was he just wasn't able to get the ball as much. And I think that's going to be Mexico's game again, try to control possession. Because that's the truth. Panama, I will say, had a really, really great 2023 due to possession. You know, obviously beating you guys, not to bring it back up, but, we, you know, 3-1 at home and then uh, beating you guys 3-0 to zero on the road. That was the big thing that killed Costa Rica in that, that two-legged series was we were able to control the ball possession so well and not let your guys in the midfield and up front have any sort of possession. And that's where, I, like I said, I think Kyrgyzki is such a vital role. And I'll also say his name as well, Godoy. You know, he is an absolute – I think a lot of people, my personal opinion in Panama, sometimes overlook him a little bit. He is a little bit older. He's 34. He's starting to come to his last years. But he is an absolute menace in the midfield. He controls it. He dominates it. If he can get up, he'll get up. He'll move back. I mean, he plays the position so well. I think like any CDM should play it. So, like I said, I think if we can really try to get those guys two going, defense, I'm not too worried. The The big thing with Maria, like I said, in the right back position is the replacement for him will be Cesar Blackman, a uh, guy coming out of, if I'm not wrong, Slovakia. He plays in their first division. He plays for their top team there, Slovan Bratsvilia. So we are loaded in the positions. But, of course, you know, the big thing, that, like I said, that will come is this Mexican team. And kind of going for a prediction because I ran with it a little bit. I'll say my prediction. I think Panama is going to win. I, I'm going to have to get my cap back on and say that I believe that the boys have enough to do it. It's going to be tight, though. This Mexican national team is not a pushover. Just to be quite honest, they're going to be the home team. That stadium is going to be 95% Mexican fans. It's going to be rocking. Arlington will be absolutely uh, crazy. So I think Panama has what it takes, though. I see this game going into added time, extra time, and I think that's where our guys will just have enough momentum, enough uh, ability to push just to see themselves saying, hey, if we've made it this far to the game, why don't we keep going? Let's finish it off right here. So I see I see a 2-1. to one. I see a 1-0 to zero for Panama. So I think that's how it'll end. Yeah, uh, honestly, I mean, I have a lot of the same thoughts that you have. I think this Mexican side is just, it's very lackluster. I've watched over the past couple of years, almost maybe every Mexican game. And they just, they lack creativity. They're, they're leaky defensively. And I, I don't know, like, I feel like they have no stability at goalkeeper because, like, are you going to roll out Ochoa again? Like, are you going to, like, who, like, what, like, what's going on there? I just feel like they're in this situation where this generation has passed, but you don't necessarily know what the future is going to look like. And I think a lot of that stuff is obviously coming back to the federation and the league and how they've been developing players and moving players and things like that. It's all kind of coming back onto them now because now – Liga MX is not reaching that status that it once did. And it's everything's kind of falling back onto them. And they just had like, like you said, you, you named the class of like Raul Jimenez, Santi Jimenez, um, Chucky Lozano, Edson Alvarez, but like Santi Jimenez hasn't done anything for Mexican national team. He hasn't done anything for them. Granted the midfield in Mexico is very lackluster. So it's not like they have a lot of creativity. Chucky Lozano He's playing all right in Eredivisie for PSV, but he took a step down. I mean, he came from Napoli, Serie A champions, to going down a level, which is not a good sign if you're a Mexican fan. I'd be worried. Raul Jimenez is older. You don't know what you're going to get with him. It, it, there's just so many question marks with that. I do like uh, who they have with like Julian Arajo playing mm. at Las Palmas. He's playing really well right now over there in La Liga. Um 
but he's kind of in and out of the lineup of who's going to really start in that left back position or is it right back left back I, left, left back, back yeah. yeah 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 um so with Mexico, there's just so many question marks. And then on top of that, they struggled against a really poor Honduras side. I mean, at one yeah. point, they were down 2-0 in aggregate, which is worrisome. Like, I mean, if they struggled that hard against Honduras, what do you think is going right. to happen when Panama comes around? A team that's really right. not going to – it's way, going to be way more defensively solid. The midfield is going to be strong. and is going to play a mid-block and try to grind out victories. So I, I don't – like – seeing obviously a lot of time has changed, but they also haven't really played much since that Honduras game. I mean, outside of some weird friendlies that don't really like mean anything in like the winter Mm. camp, but even then they lost to Uzbekistan. They lost to, um, tied. They did tie. They tied tied to Uzbekistan. I'm sorry. And then they tied to, uh, Germany, which is a good result, but Germany Mm -hmm. is also, I mean, even a bad Germany is still, Nonetheless, but they also tied to Australia. So Mm -hmm. these are teams that traditionally Mexico, outside of the Germany one, would have no problem handling. So over the track record, they don't look very good. And then if you look at the last few games against Panama, like you said, 1-0, 1-0, 1-0, 1-1. And then in 2019, they won 3-0, which is probably around the time Mm -hmm. when Panama started to change. And then mm-hmm. Mexico started to fall. So within this more current generation, they're not scoring more than one goal against Panama. So and Panama is progressively getting better. And like you said, with the ability to control the midfield, that's going to be a, a huge advantage, which I think Panama will be able to do. And I think this game is going to probably end, if Panama to advance. They're going to have to take this to extra time. Like you said, I don't know if they're going to win this in regulation because I do worry about Panama's capability to score goals. I feel yeah. like the one thing you guys lack is a true high quality striker and wingers. Like if you guys could really get, I mean, you know better than I, but from what I see on the outside looking in is that you guys lack a little bit more quality up top. Like you guys are very solid defensively and in the midfield, but you haven't yet been able to find that guy in your generation to really like take on that back line and really attack the forefront. So mm-hmm. I think Panama is going to advance on this, in my opinion, on my prediction, on a shootout. I think it's going to be a one-one draw. It's going to go to extra yeah. time, and they're going to get a shootout and advance because I just see this game playing out that way based on the past few years, on history, yeah. based on the way Mexico's looked in the past six months. I, this is just to me a recipe for a one-one defensive midfield battle. Mm-hmm. Was, somebody's going to win in transition. They're going to get their goals in transition, and then it's going to shootouts. So, yeah, and I have Panama getting. I just have like I just feel like there's so much emotion mm-hmm. riding on Panama right now. There's so much. Yeah, I mean, coming off that big victory against Costa Rica, a team that's traditionally beat up on Panama throughout mm-hmm. the decades, I think they're riding high right now. Mexico's yeah. on the lowest of lows. You don't know like like I don't even remember who the coach is at Mexico right now. They're cycling through coaches. Like there's just so oh, much yeah. more stability. Is it in Jimmy, Jimmy Lozano. So, yeah. Jimmy Lozano. Jimmy. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Right, so there's right. just so much more stability that's been there. There's cohesion. Mm-hmm. And the same thing with Panama. And let me know if you agree with me. I feel like mm-hmm. Christensen has done a really good job of mimicking what their players play like in their clubs. I think they've done, and maybe it's just coincidence, yeah. but it seems like I'd agree with that. Every yeah. it seems like the team is built the national team is built just like every other player's club team like Mm -hmm. houston kind of plays like a panama marseille kind of plays like a panama like Mm -hmm. nashville kind of plays like a. it seems like they all kind of like made sure that all right we're going to build this team around what they play like in the club level so it almost kind of in my in a way to me it kind of mirrors that and i don't know if you agree with me in something like that and i think that helps a lot with a lot of the cohesion because it feels like players don't feel the need i mean like we briefly mentioned the u.s you don't know if geo rain is going to play the wing you don't know i mean none of these players Mm -hmm. really play four three three and then they come to national team it's all like all mixed and it's just it's weird versus i feel like panama that has so much of that cohesion so right because yeah, of that, yeah, I have I, Panama advancing, making it to their first final, Nations League final. Right, right. I do want to shout out one guy, though. I think 
uh, talking about, like you were saying, that center nine, uh, that number nine role. I think this guy, he has the roof. This is maybe a guy we can talk more about later, you know, another day on one of the pods. But I hope hopefully we'll talk more about him playing in Europe as well. Eduardo Guerrero. I, I will personally say for me, he's probably arguably one of my favorite players, uh, of course, for me. But I also genuinely think he is one of our top 10 players on our national team. He has played a few times uh, with the national team. He His last call-up that he had with us was back in the Nations League first window against Martinique, and I want to say Guatemala. And he played a little bit in both games. The big thing I will say that that's this is kind of, I guess you could say, typical Latin American, especially was in the Martinique game, he had a wide-open shot and missed it. The goalkeeper saved it. Then he had a follow-up and missed that as well. So, of course, you know, Panamanians, as we do, we took to social media and we ridiculed him. You know, <laughs> we, we, I wouldn't say attacked him, but we went at him and we were like, yeah, you know, he's off. But this guy, he's played Conference League. So he plays over in Ukraine right now with Zoria Lahansk. Uh, I don't want to butcher it too bad, but that's the team he's with over in Ukraine. And he's doing quite well. His team is like they're a mid-table team right now. Last season, they qualified to Europa League, got knocked down to Conference League this past season. But he was scoring goals against teams like Ghent out of Belgium. And then there was another team from Israel he scored against. So he's doing quite, I would say, quite well in Europe. But he's kind of like like we were talking a little bit about, kind of like a, like a, a I guess you could kind of say like a Gio Reyna has that ability, you know what he has and what he brings to the table, but can he bring it to the national team level? Can he bring it when the games actually matter? So I think that's a young guy to watch out for. I genuinely believe he'll make the 23-man camp because the numbers right now, they're at 60. They're going to get cut down to 23. Uh, I want to say in the next week or so for all these countries. So I think he's a big guy to watch out for. And like you said, I think – the emotions are high after that Honduras game. I know a lot of Central Americans, a lot of people were rallying around and saying, do it for Honduras, you know, do it for the robbery uh, against Mexico. <laughs> but I ha- we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. And yeah, I think it's going to be a good game, though, regardless. Yeah. All right. Well, let's swap over to the play in games, I guess. I'll talk a little bit about Costa Rica versus Honduras, which is going to be the more the bigger one. I I think we can kind of skip over Trinidad and Canada. I think we both believe Canada is going to advance and make the Copa America qualification. I don't really know much about Trinidad. I know they have a couple MLS players that aren't Mm -hmm. the best. Like, um, they're they're a one man show. Yeah. Levi and Garcia. I, he's yes. Yeah. And yeah. I can say pretty much I think we can all say Canada's gonna advance here. Um yeah. now we can go deeper into them once we get into our more Copa America draw and predict as we go through. Yeah. Um but yeah, let's swap over to Costa Rica, same Honduras. So see <sighs> Costa Rica is in a weird situation right now. So what's going on with Costa Rica is they held on for the people who don't know, and how I always explain it to people is Costa Rica held on for too long on that golden generation. They held on for way too long. They, the, the hype in 2014 was probably the craziest the country has ever been when it comes to football. It was one of the most successful runs in the country's history. Being able to make it to a quarterfinal in the World Cup was incredible. I mean, you had an amazing talent, but... It came to a point where even in 20, I think they wanted to try to run it back in 2018 with the same squad. And even then, I think it was time to let go. I understood the idea of keeping some of those guys, but I thought around there, they should have started to try to sprinkle in some more people. But mm-hmm. they tried. But the problem was Costa Rica has what they called a missing middle. They had a missing generation. So that generation that was supposed to take the reins in 2018 – didn't really come out to anything. A lot of those guys kind of fell apart. No one really stood out from the crowd. You had a couple guys that went to MLS, but didn't really do much once they got there. A couple guys that went to lower level leagues in Europe, nothing much really got out of there. So it forced, I don't want to say forced, but it got to a point where we had to keep on the Brian Ruiz's. We had to keep the Celso Borges. We had to keep, Kayla Navas wasn't going anywhere. And Joel Campbell was still young enough. So those two were staying. Um, mm. the Bolaños, it's, you know, keep on going down the list. And to the point where leading into World Cup qualifying, 
for the World Cup, I'm like, what are we doing? Like, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. Because everything changed once we hired Luis Fernando Suarez. Luis Fernando Suarez, I believe, is one of the worst things to ever happen in Costa Rican football. I 100% believe he waited way too long because there was a growing generation that's happening in the Costa Rican league that's playing really well, that's playing really high-quality ball, but he wasn't playing them. He wasn't starting them because, you know, the problem is if you don't put these players on a national team on a level for the eyes to see, you're not going to be able to sell players. It's a lot harder to sell players from the club level in Costa Rica and then send them over. The best way for these guys, like your Joel Campbells, like your Brian Ruiz, like all, was them performing in these World Cup games. Like, because mm-hmm. of the 2014, Joel Campbell went to Arsenal. Like, mm-hmm. you know, like, you needed to yeah. play these guys. So you needed to show that the talent that's there. And he refused to play them. He believed he was more focused on winning than the betterment of the Federation. Mm-hmm. He So they played the ultimate terrorist football that I've ever seen. I mean, you this guy would put Jose Mourinho to shame. I mean, he was, he was parking the bus on like team, unless it was an absolute shitter team, like on, I couldn't like, I don't know, like Dominica or something like that. That would be the right. only time he would play <laughs> offensively. And then one game, the final world cup qualifying game, once they knocked out Panama and Panama was pretty much not making the world cup. Then they yeah. want to play the young talent, right? Brian Aguilera, Anthony Contreras, um, mm-hmm. uh, Jewish and Bennett, Kenneth Vargas, they then then they want to play these games, and then what happened? They beat the U.S. two one, and then what happened that following uh, winter transfer window? Yeah, one the one of the biggest transfer windows in Costa Rican history of uh, local talent going overseas. So once the World Cup comes around, they're all too late, all too old. Like they had a great run. They beat Japan. They put Germany on the ropes, but. Mm. Look, I wanted them to get out of the group. I thought it was possible. But for some reason, we keep this fucking guy, Luis Fernando Mm -hmm. Suarez, after the World Cup, knowing that everybody hated him, all this stuff. Then we go into the Gold Cup with the same roster we took. I'm like, (laughs) when are you going to let these guys just retire? Let them retire. If Costa Rica would have brought their number one squad with all that talent, I firmly believe they would have won that World Cup. I mean, that Gold Cup. They would have won that Gold Cup because our top team would have beat, I firmly believe, would have beat Mexico. I yeah. think they would have beat the USA team because that US team, USA team sucked. And yeah, if they yeah. would have brought their A squad, they would have won the Gold Cup. I firmly believe that. I think. Yeah. I, Were they I, beating I, Panama I, in the group stage? I think so. I, I think it was possible. I think it's yeah. possible if they actually played their full starting lineup. But mm-hmm. because we've waited so long, you now get to a point. We get a new coach, Gustavo Alvaro, has a great track record with Ecuador and Boca Juniors. He he's done a really good job of what he did in Ecuador, really reshaping. It's a shame that he got let go, but I understand. Um, but he did a really great job of really turning that Ecuador team into uh, a powerhouse now in South America. Ecuador is now a team that you have to look out for with the, all the players and talents that they have. So. I love the hire. I thought it was a great hire. It's a guy who prioritizes the youth, prioritizes trying to get the most out of these young guys to help them move forward because that's what he did for Ecuador. And what do you know? The moment he gets hired, we have the summer transfer window. More kids are getting shipped out. He's like, send them to MLS, send them to Europe, send them wherever. You got to get them out of here. You got to get them out of here. I don't care if they have first team minutes, if they're playing well in the academy, if they got mm-hmm. like a couple minutes, get them out of here. So now we finally get this generation that everybody's been wanting this U23 generation that has so much talent, like Brandon Aguilera, uh, Manfred Ugaldi, uh, Juice and Bennett, Kenneth Vargas, um, uh, uh, Braun, so on and so forth. But they weren't ready yet. They weren't ready for the raft that was about to be Panama. You're throwing these guys into their first game ever. This is one of the most talented generations we've seen in probably 10 years. And then you throw them into a game and a must win to make the Copa America a chance that you only have the opportunities that's very slim because we don't know if we're going to get this opportunity again. We didn't even know if we're going to get in 2016 again. Mm -hmm. You don't know when you're going to get this again. And now they're fucked because I didn't anticipate Costa Rica winning that game because these guys weren't ready. They didn't have the experience. They're barely even getting first team minutes on their clubs right now. 
And you mean to tell me you had to put them against the Panama team where everybody on that team is starting. They all have been built in the system for the past four years under Christensen. They're all, and it just sucks that if they would have let go of Suarez a long time ago, they could have put this generation in through the gold cup, got great experience, did some friendlies going into that game and doing it. So that's what yeah. really worries me about this to go back to the game. Now, after have giving all that background knowledge, it's like, that's what worries me about this Costa Rica Honduras game. I believe Costa Rica has far more talent than the Honduras team. I actually watched the Honduras team play Iceland in a friendly at Inter Miami Stadium a couple weeks ago. I actually worked that game. I watched them. They looked atrocious. They looked bad. I don't know if that was their first team. I don't know. I feel like it is because bit. I feel like they had to get. Yeah, I don't know if you watched it. I, yeah, I don't know what their first team exactly. Obviously, they're missing some players, I would assume. But Mm -hmm. on paper, they should win this game. But what concerns me is just the lack of experience. I would assume what Honduras was able to do against Mexico, granted it's a weak Mexico team, but it's still Mexico at the end of the day. That that really worries me. I believe on I think if this team had more experience, they could win. And I if I had to go to a prediction, I feel that talent will be able to supersede all. And even though with the lack of experience, I believe they have the talent to do it. I think this Costa Rica team, there, there's still some players that are key players for the future that still need to get consistent minutes. Um, I'm glad to see the loan from Brandon Aguilera going over to Bristol Rivers in League One and absolutely tearing it up his first game, playing it so well. Mm-hmm. He already had a couple minutes at Nottingham Forest. I'm hoping to see him get some more once this loan's over. I think Nottingham is just in a position where they're just fighting regulation relegation and they don't want to try to push him yet i think they want to be in a more safe i think if nottingham was mid-table he'd play because all i'm hearing from nottingham fans from what he's doing in nottingham too that this guy's a baller he's playing really well i can't see the footage Mm -hmm. because they just don't have it but everybody's saying that they're super excited for him he's playing well goes to bristol rivers bristol rovers my bad and playing out of his mind manfred ugaldi probably the best player right now in the pool playing amazing in the area de vizier for some reason, in the winter, he went to Russia. It makes absolutely no sense to me. Me and Will talked about this off the thing. Yeah. I understand the money. It was a big transfer for 20, FC 20. Mm-hmm. But why would you accept to go, man? I know it was a $15 million transfer. That's huge for right. 20. I think it's one of the biggest that they ever got. But come on. You're 20 years old. You're playing in the area. Makes no a, top three, a top three yeah. team. A team that's fighting for Champions League positioning, if not for sure Europa. And you go to a yeah. Russian team that is completely out of European don't competitions. Don't even play. Yeah, It's like, come on. I, from what I understand, he's already starting and getting uh, goals and stuff there. But it's like, dude, if you would have waited to the summer, he would have got a La Liga transfer or a Serie A. He would have he would have went to the top five leagues 100%. 100%. So that yeah. was a huge – gut blow to a lot of the Costa Rican fan base was to see pretty much the golden boy, one of the two golden boys, which is him and Brandon Aguilera, mm. to see him go to a league of such lesser quality and not being able to play at a higher level, knowing that dude had eight goals and seven assists in the first half of the area de Vizier. He would have got – he's like right then alone, he's one of the top strikers in CONCACAF. And then he would have got a really great move, and he would have been competing as one of the best strikers in CONCACAF, um, right. a top three striker in CONCACAF. But it's a shame. I mean, the good thing is he's still young, so there's a possibility for him to mm-hmm. come back over to the top five leagues. He is only 20, so if he plays well, maybe he can get out of there. He yeah. well. But to the yeah. game, I think Costa Rica – I think they're going to get it – I think they're going to get it done – I think they're going to have enough quality. I think all their players that are role players in their game are playing really well. I think Zamora in the Greek league is playing well. Brandon Aguilar is playing well. Manfred Ugaldi is playing well. Braun just got a move to Minnesota United in the MLS. Scored in his debut game. And for Minnesota, okay. yeah, it's Austin I SC. Saw that. Um, yes. And he's yeah. also just been playing well in general the last two games. So Mm -hmm. I'm really excited to see what he's going to be because they need another midfielder, a more defensive-minded midfielder, number eight. And think the only thing Costa Rica is really missing is that number six because I think the center back position, um, Juan Juan Pablo Vargas, is really good. He plays at Millonarios, won the champion Mm -hmm. in Colombia. 
he was supposed to get a move to Brazilian Serie A. I would have super excited to get see him play in a higher level league, which I believe is a top six league in a, the world. I they believe the Brazilian league is better than the Eredivisie. I think it would have been awesome to see him go. Deal fell through. Ended up staying at Colombia with the Millonarios. Sucks. I would have loved to see him test himself a little bit more in a higher level league, but whatever. What can you do? Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, and then uh, you have Julio Cascante who plays at Austin FC who. I don't know how to feel about him yet. There's still time. Yeah. Uh, you still have Francisco Calvo. Um, but the, uh, I would say the biggest weaknesses with Costa Rica is the number six position or number five, depending on how you word that. Um, and the the right backs, the right and the left back. Th- those worry me a lot because I don't know if Monterita yeah. is going to be healthy. Um, Ovedo, Brian Ovedo at Real Salt Lake is not playing well. So yeah. I don't know. We'll see how things go. Um, I don't know much about Honduras. But based off that information, I don't know if you can give any insight on Honduras. Much you know. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like you were saying, Julian, I'll go ahead and go quick with mine. Also in the prediction a little bit. I agree with you. I think Costa Rica has enough. enough, I don't want to say enough manpower, but they have enough ability to be able to push through the lines of Honduras. And I'm just going to quite say it. Honestly, I think the Honduranian defense now, granted, I will give them a little bit of leg room. They did well against the Mexican team. In a sense, I mean, obviously they conceded to, you know, and then that whole shabam will happen. But I think the thing is, Honduras' is defense, I mean, I've seen these guys. They do have one star player. Uh, he's not too bad. He made a move over, I want to say, to Romania, Daniel Maldonado. He used to play in LAFC over here in the MLS. He is not bad, mm, but yeah, yeah. God – almighty he has nobody helping him out they are lee key and here's the big thing and i'm going to kind of go into the prediction real quick why i think costa rica is going to win and why you guys are going to be able to make it to the Copa america this summer honduras is just rattled not just with injuries i don't know if you saw what happened to albert ellis he's out you know and all ups to him uh prayers for him hope you know he can come back and bounce back well he had a really bad injury over in france but then also the yellow card uh, situation. I I don't have the list on my phone. I was trying to look for it a little bit earlier ago, but I remember right. going off of it. Their goalkeeper, Endrick Menfidar, <laughs> if I'm not pronouncing that, I'm probably butchering his name also, but he's out. He's not playing. Daniel Maldonado got a red card against Mexico. He's out. I forgot about that. It's been so yeah. long. Choco Lozano, I'm pretty sure one of their best attacking uh, players that they even have on their team is out. So the thing is, it's really going to come down to who is Honduras going to play. And, and that's the thing. They still have guys that can play and, and obviously guys that can fill in those roles. But it cut out a little bit, Will. Cut this is going to be a completely different team. All right, you're back now. You're good. You're good. at all going to be the manpower that they have. One guy I will say for Honduras that Costa Rica needs to watch out for. I mean, he's obviously a big threat, and he I'll give it. He's been killing it over in Scotland, but not as of late, though. Luis Palma. Uh, Palma's obviously, you know, the star boy for these guys. He's the big guy. He used to be actually – you probably knew this little fun fact. He was teammates with – who are the Costa Ricans that played – Aris over in Greece again. It's uh, Zamora, right? Uh, Zamora, Ronald Monterita, and now Jusin Bennett is on loan. And lo- Okay. He played with a few of those guys. He used to play at Aries. He made the move over to Celtic last summer, I believe. He goes over there. He's killing it. Of course, obviously, take that. You know, you guys take that how you want. This is the Scottish Premier League, so it is a little bit more leaky mm-hmm. defenses and whatnot. But – he has been killing it, though, for Celtic regardless. He did uh, – I want to say he scored two or three Champions League goals. So he's definitely a threat to watch out for. But like I said, they, they're just going to be leaking in places. I mean, I think the goalkeeping position, you know, they have Buba Lopez, who's also – he was the guy. He went with them to the 2016 Rio Olympics. Uh, he led them in World Cup qualifying. He was their starter. But he is – I mean, he he has been – he hasn't even been performing well in the Andoranian League. You know, and if that's saying anything, it, he is he is not letting much. Uh, he's not he's not stopping much. He's letting a lot of stuff go by him. So I think that's where he's going to kind of come down. I think Costa Rica, like you said, obviously on paper, and even more with you know putting four or five guys 
off the Honduras team on the bench, not even being able to play. I think Costa Rica has a better roster. They should. I say should very carefully, but they should win this game. Um, yeah. Realistically. My, that, there oh, go ahead. Finish. I was just going to say real quick. Realistically, also, this is going to be a home game for Honduras. It's in Texas. There will be yeah. Costa Ricans. I know you guys travel well. You guys travel really well. But it is going to be a little bit more of a home field for Honduras. So with that in consideration, though, I still think Costa Rica should win. I'm saying 2-0. But it could be a one zero. It could be a penalty shootout. It's gonna be. It's gonna be a tight. It's gonna be a brawl. But Costa Rica should win. Yeah, and that's like I said. My biggest concern is experience. I think the talent is for sure there. I think the talent is like levels ahead of Honduras. It's it's just it's really the experience. I mean, these guys are so young. I mean, the good thing is, is you could say they already played against a tough Panama team in an elimination game, so they have that on their belt now. But I know I mentioned the two wing, the the two left uh, uh, fullbacks, but I, you know I'm also a little worried about what's going on at the left back position with Juice and Bennett. Juice and Bennett, he's not getting any play. He he got a little bit of playing time at Sunderland. He got a loan over to Greece at uh, Aries, but he hasn't played yet at Aries. He's still he he's still on the bench. Zamora is a consistent starter. So I'm a little worried of what, what's going to happen on, on the left side because the right side seems pretty sad because you have Jimmy Marine who plays in the Russian league. And then you also have Kenneth Vargas, which I think he should be getting the start over Marine. I think we've seen enough of Marine. I think he's not going to get any better. He is what he is. I'd rather get the, the looks to Vargas and Vargas has looked better in time he has, but I am a little worried about that left side. I don't know if he's going to go two strikers and go to four four two. I think currently, as the roster stands, that might be the best route to go because Anthony Contreras, he just got to move to the Cyprus League from Latvia. Look, I don't know how you. I don't think those leagues are that great. But the one thing is, though, is that he's playing consistently and he's playing well. Um, yeah. He did play a little bit of Conference League qualifications uh, this past year. Look, I, I think he needs to get a real move to like a real league, but he's still playing consistently and he's scoring goals. So, and then he hasn't looked terrible for the Costa Rican team, but I would like to see him get a, a better move. I, I, until, until Juison can really establish himself as a left winger, I think you, you probably got to go with the 4 4 2. And I think Gustavo Alvaro realized that too and that's why he kind of did that in that second game against panama yeah. so i i'm really interested but i think the midfield is looking really good uh another guy who's and en- who just started getting some minutes and just started getting called up on the bench uh yosemar uh alconocer uh he has a okay. tough name alconocer he plays in the belgium mm-hmm. league he got a move he played in the past gold cup in costa rica he's one of the few young guys they actually brought up he played well. He got uh, transferred over to the Belgium League for um, Western Low. Western Low. Mm-hmm. Um, he got a couple minutes in the beginning of the season. Got injured. He's finally starting to come back. He's on the bench. I think the coach is easing him in. He's a really young guy, but he played well in the Gold Cup. He could potentially get some minutes. I'm curious to see if he gets called up. Um, but he's a he's a more of a cam central attacking midfielder. So the midfield I, I, I like outside of not having a CDM, but. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Braun, with the way he's playing in Minnesota, I think he's going to get a look. So uh, I think you're going to have to – I think Costa Rica, to win this game, is going to have to rely on their stars. They're going to have to rely on Brandon Aguilera to really step mm-hmm. up and create chances and score goals. And he's going to have to really link up well with Manfred Ugaldi because, honestly, we've yet to really see it see them link up together. And once they can establish that, we're going to be a dangerous force in CONCACAF for a long time because mm-hmm. those guys are so young and so much potential and playing at high-level leagues. Uh, and same thing with Vargas. He's playing it's Scottish Premier League. Not very, like you said, but he does play for Hearts. Hearts mm-hmm. play European competitions. They compete really well with Celtic and Rangers. They're not at the, the level of them, but they're not like bottom feeder Scottish League. I mean, they're top-tier Scottish League team. So mm-hmm. and he's playing well. He's starting every game. He's scoring goals, getting assists. So <clears throat> I think you're going to have to rely on those three guys to get put up points because 
it seems like Kaylor Navas is not coming. I'm curious. I'm wondering yeah. if he is. I'm curious. I'm really curious. Gonna, Kaylor Navas can be very yeah. weird. He he only really comes for the cha- the World Cup qualifying and the World Cup. He he tends right. to call out, but he's another person. Oh, look, he's always been the staple in Costa Rica, but he's somebody I'm worried about. He PSG royally fucked him. Like he's been getting fucked over left and right. He's one of the most disrespected players. Mm-hmm. In modern day his in soccer, because he's Costa Rican, he should have yeah. never lost his job at Real Madrid. I get that Courtois <clears throat> ends up being an amazing goalkeeper and probably the best in the world right now, but mm-hmm. he had no business losing his job. He goes to PSG. I say carried PSG to a Champions League final, played amazing for them, and then they call in Donnarumma, who I think is a bum. I think he's completely overrated. I don't think he's good at all. He hasn't shown me mm-hmm. anything. And then even when they were playing, swapping him back and forth last year between Donnarumma and Keller Navas, Keller Navas let in way less goals than Donnarumma. But now PSG stuck because they fucking paid him so much money. And now yeah. Keller Navas is riding the bench. And it sucks because I was hoping Keller Navas can get a loan this winter, but he didn't. I was hoping maybe he can go back to Nottingham because he played really well there. And there was talks of him potentially going back because Matt Turner being a bust, but nothing ended up yeah. Going into that, he was supposed to go to Napoli. Never, nothing ever really formulated from that. It just sucks that PSG won't get rid of him. PSG wants to keep him because I think deep down they don't trust Donnarumma. But mm-hmm. now he's not getting playing time and it's hurting the Costa Rican teams. But that's that's another. I trust him that he's a he's a pros pro. He's a veteran. Like I believe he. But you know, you cat with goalkeepers, man. It's hard to get that that live game time. So we shall yeah. see, man. But. I know we want to talk about some other things, but I know time is running tough, running tight. And uh, but I kind of like that we did a full breakdown of Nation League. I thought we were yeah. able to provide the most insight imaginable. I like kind of showcasing. It's kind of you know, it's like a Copa America warm up, man. It's like it's right, like right. We're getting ready Copa for America. it. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. Uh, you know, I did want to talk some Champions Cup and Champions League, but you know, those are still need to be finished. So I don't mind holding off on those a little bit. So, mm-hmm. but yeah, man. Um, any final thoughts, Will? Just uh, kind of like you were saying, I think this is going to be a fun uh, Concacaf Nations League. I'm excited for international football. We've been waiting since November. Uh, obviously, like you were saying, Julian, you know the talks with with Kaler. You know the team. What type of team is Honduras going to come out with? Uh, what type of team is Costa Rica going to kind of come out with? You know, I, I think this is what makes personally my obviously a little bit biased. Again, as well, but I think CONCACAF, obviously, up to par level, we are not, you know, number one, number two, any by any means, by player wise. But I think we have probably one of the most exciting regions with our fans, with our players. So I'm excited for this Nations League games. I really, like I said, I hope Panama. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Joel Campbell running up as the center nine, you know, players running off the field, coaches getting at it. You know, it it's what makes CONCACAF exciting. So I think this this is going to be a fun Nations League. Um, obviously, like you said, we'll talk more about it whenever these games break down and then we'll get back to uh, CONCACAF, uh, CONCACAF Champions Cup and MLS and stuff like that. Yeah, man. Well, I want to thank everybody. If you guys made it to the end of the show, I greatly appreciate it. And you guys haven't done so already, please like and subscribe to the channel. And if you guys are on audio, please give us a follow and a rating. Or if you're on Apple Podcasts, leave us a review. We would greatly appreciate it. It means a lot to us. And I want to thank everybody for all the support we've been getting recently. Things are starting to take off and do well. We have some more things cooking in the background that we want to do to bring some more content to you guys. And uh, yeah. We will see you guys in the next one. Peace out, everybody.